Good afternoon, friends. Stephen Benoon here with Israeli News Live. And as you're looking on the screen here, we have a website, doTERRA Oils. Leon Green, Leon Green, good friend of ours. Uh, I am with Leon every Tuesday morning. I actually be there with him tomorrow morning on John Moore's uh, program there, uh, doing the round table. And we brought Leon on today as a guest here to talk about the situation in uh, that's going on in the Middle East right now, this this tensions between the U.S., Israel, Iran, and, of course, a lot of other uh, nations there in the Middle East. Leon Green, thank you, brother. Former naval officer, thank you for joining us here today on Israeli News Live. Thank you very much, Stephen. I'm, I'm, I'm honored to be on, on your show. I've watched your show many times online, and I love what you what you educate people with and also stay in the word of God as well. Thank you, my brother. We really appreciate that. We'll talk a little bit more guys uh, about uh, the product that Leon represents later this evening, but the simple thing about it is just doTERRA.com forward slash Leon L E O N is that website. If you want to just make sure you write it down. So no, sometimes not everybody watches a video to the end. So just be sure to check that out. I know my wife is a diehard, doTERRA oil, uh, including my son as well. He also is really into doTERRA oil. So uh, that, that no doubt it bless a lot of people. And we'll, I'll have you talk about that later in the broadcast here. Uh, Leon, we have, as you know already, the situation uh, with this threat of war with Iran has been, has been building. Uh, we've reported on it on multiple occasions there. Uh, the situation very fluid, and you know I, I've been hearing from sources that I know, uh, Pentagon plus Middle East, also out of Israel, uh, and, and just going back and forth. And in fact, uh, Iran threatening to attack our our naval ships there in the Persian Gulf unless they left. Uh, President Trump had ordered the USS Nimitz out of the Persian Gulf only to turn around and uh, reverse that plan. And he sent the carrier Nimitz, he ordered it to stay in the Middle East amid the Iranian threats of revenge. Uh, and, and then of course, we were seeing one of the intels actually coming right, I had some intel right out of Iran itself saying that Iran was getting ready to do what they called a sting attack on U.S. forces, which uh, I interpret that as being not something enough to provoke U.S. retaliation, but something that they could say, they're just reminding America, you killed General Soleimani a year ago, and, and we want to... Uh, remind you that we still are not happy about what happened. Now, as far as the anniversary of the death of uh, General Soleimani, it did not happen. But as of now, we have not seen anything uh, that has happened uh, by Iran thus far. And I want to get some of your thoughts on these things that are going on uh, and, and, and to, to get your perspective uh, from from being a former naval officer, uh, Brother Leon, on, on these things. Yes, sir. Well, when I was in, I was at the first Persian Gulf. Uh, it was the Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. So we were supposed to have a six month glory, uh, pretty much a cruise, a dream cruise, many different places in Tahiti, Australia, Singapore, and that was all Canex. Because we had we left Hong Kong and said nope we're going to the Gulf, and so we got there six months earlier and then we were there for a total of eleven months when I mean, it should have just been a you know we only had three months left back in the in the cruise so you know I'm intimate about you know having been there and been in the um, Straits of Hormuz and it's it's pretty tight I've been to the Straits of Gibraltar on a pleasure cruise and it's it's even tighter than that so you can see how easy it is to shut down the straits. And if, if they shut it down either by attacking a couple of super tankers like they have in the past, you know, the price of gas would be more like the European prices, eight and ten dollars a gallon. So it wouldn't take very much to do something like that. And then if you think, look, there's only two weeks left before 
the official transfer of Trump to Biden, um, but they still want to, you know, make a symbolic statement saying, "Hey, we don't care who's going to be in the White House. You know, we want to, we want to give you this thing like, like you described it." And then I also think about how I was reading on Al Jazeera. It said that they they're working with the UN to do a special investigation to prosecute President Trump and the 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 House, the White House. So there's there's a lot of a lot of things attached to this, and it's just surprising that, you know, they're going to take a chance for two weeks left to try to get any retaliation, even though, that, you know, it wouldn't be too prudent to do that. You know, this is something that, and, and this is something that I've seen change quite a bit as well, just talking to some of the people there uh, in Washington about the situation. And when when I was first getting the information coming out of the Middle East that Iran was uh, one, I'd gotten the information that Iran had threatened to attack uh, our, our, our ships there in the, in the region. And then I had also gotten this, this information that they had talked about doing a, a stinger operation. And that was Iran doing a sting operation, not enough to provoke an all-out war, but enough to, like I said, to send a message. And so I'm, I'm asking... Uh, some friends there in Washington about the, about that situation, and they're saying to me that yes, they were aware, and that they were on high alert uh, of this. But at the same token, as you mentioned, because of the election issue, uh, that was brought up in the conversation as well. That Trump is only a couple of weeks uh, of him going out of office. Of course, there is. Uh, reports from people that I know there that are saying that there's still a possibility that he will remain in office, which we might talk about that before the end of the broadcast here. And uh, but but nonetheless, that's not written in stone. And so the Joint Chiefs of Staff were uh, saying to the president to stand down, and only if we are struck should he retaliate. Uh, but there's also been told that he's under a tremendous amount of pressure to go to war with Iran. That pressure, of course, coming from Israel. They want him to do it. And then I was told that the president uh, would rather Israel, if there's going to be a first strike, they want Israel to make that first strike. Then the president could get more support uh, politically in backing Israel if they make the first strike in protecting Israel. Uh, your thoughts on this? Yeah, it sounds about right. And, and knowing that there are 66 or 60 some um, congressmen that have dual citizenship, you know, it seems like you know they're definitely motivated to do that. And I can see how they want. I mean, if you look out how the um, I told us, you know, they call Israel the little Satan and we're the great Satan. And so, you know, they're like, okay, if we're going to pick if they think that Israel's going to hit first, then yeah, we would go to their aid. And you know, we and, and by having the our sub there, there's Georgia, and then the Israeli sub that went through the canal a couple of weeks ago that you described. You know, we're telling everybody in the neighborhood, we're not going to be messing around, even if we only have two and a half weeks left. Don't play around. So it, it looks like Israel would have to strike first if if, if he's taking the, the brunt of the pressure from the, the Joint Chiefs not to do anything because of that. So, you know, now it's all conjecture, but it seemed like it makes sense because the way you described it during the the latter two weeks of December, you know, I was expecting some kind of hit to occur, but, and I'm glad it didn't didn't happen. Yeah, it would make it very awkward in that situation, that type of situation. Uh, you mentioned uh, just a second ago, Leon, about uh, the U.S. also having one of our own subs over there, and uh, that's very true. If you could tell a little bit, because I know with you being in the Navy, you know more about this type of firepower uh, we have, what is it, the USS Georgia. Uh, we've got it actually up on the screen for people there uh, in, in the region there. And of course, if you can uh, elaborate what type of not only firepower, say the USS Georgia has, but we also have the USS Nimitz there, uh, what, what would be at our disposal if we were to end up finding ourselves in a, in a situation with Iran right now uh, and having to go into combat there with what we have that you're aware of, not counting what Israel has there already as well. Israel also sending their own subs, attack subs, into the Persian Gulf region. Well, yes, the, the Nimitz, you know, and, and its entire strike group is, is a quite a formidable 
enemy and a, a force in, in itself. And then you had the make an island, it was just make an island uh, strike group. And so that was very similar to what we had when we went to the first prison golf and so forth. In our case, we have the Macon, which is our LHD, which is a landing helicopter dock, and then we had two LPDs. And on my ship, the USS Ogden, LPD-5, you know, we had 1,500 Marines and 29 SEALs, SEAL Team 5 and SEAL um, 5th Mew. And now they have the 15th Mew and two, uh, 20, uh, and two ships. So they have the LCACs, the, you know, those are the air cushion devices that can carry in um, tanks and pretty much everything else. And then they have the, the Macon itself. So the Macon Island has the ability, you know, to, to use the F, F-35 strikes, uh, strike tanks. And so that would be a lot of firepower and it would be very, very condensed. So and if Israel came in from the, the north and we came in from the southwest, yeah, it would be very fast. With the USS Georgia, the Georgia has has can carry up to sixty six special forces or seals. And they have the underwater subs, and so if they're already in the Persian Gulf, you know, at a certain distance, all they have to do is drop the sub and then just keep on going. So that, that is extremely formidable, and you've seen how effective the seals are. So, and then they also have over a hundred plus Tomahawk cruise missiles. So. You know, all of those coordinates we share and all the other places have already been targeted. So all we have to do is pop up, launch a bunch, uh, launch a bunch of them, and then, you know, Israel will be flying right over the top. Of and I saw how many of the, um, the electronic warfare uh, squadrons were on board the Nimitz and the Macon Islands. So because of that, you know, they will coordinate both all three attack groups. So it would not be prudent for them to try that in two weeks, but if Israel is adamant about doing it, yeah, we could definitely back it up. And, you know, we talk about the Tomahawk cruise missiles that are on the ships there. Uh, Leon, are any of these, uh, do they have nuclear tips as well for these types of weapons? Because I, I, I know that at one point, I was told that uh, there would be a tactical nukes that would be used in a battle with Iran and, uh, and that, of course, as Iran put it, as one of their uh, own from the inside said to me there that uh, the U.S. is basically, and Israel would have 24 hours to be able to totally obliterate the Iranian military. And if they don't do it within that period of time, the retaliation that Iran will give back uh, with their own ballistic missiles that they have now dispersed throughout the entire Middle East uh, that green light was given by the Khomeini uh, with a protest of President Rouhani, but uh, they have now sent, and that has been confirmed by uh, Washington uh, insiders there, that uh, those uh, ballistic missiles have been dispersed to Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, and also Yemen. So wh what is the capabilities with these uh, tomahawks? Yes, they do have the capability to have tactical moves, so you know that's very feasible. It's a hundred plus. Yeah, it would it would be very easy to do that. This that, that submarine is more than capable of accomplishing those goals. And so, yes, they could. And, and I remember your statement. I think it was three or four months ago. You described how the U.S. government has the ability to track, you know, any nuclear weapon throughout the world at all times. So if they, you know, that 24 hour window, that would make sense. You know, that if they were going to do something like that, they could be, have the green light for a certain amount of time. And then, you know, the Yemenis, the Syrians and Jordanians would all go ballistic on, on Israel and, and America. So uh, it, it is feasible. And if they did that, I'd be surprised it's even 24 hours. It seemed like once they saw that Iran was attacked, you'd think they would, it would just be like a, a silent code saying, okay, if you start seeing cities get evaporated, then you just launch. So I, I, I don't think, I don't think the 24 hour window would even be necessary because, um, you know, once you started seeing attack, an attack, you know, these sleeper cells would automatically know it's too late. If we don't go soon, we're just going to get blasted too. That's a, I can, I can certainly concur with that. And I know that, uh, uh, I was told that 
what the what the issue is is that Iran has already realized that if their communications are taken down, they have given orders already to uh, their different allies uh, in the region there that uh, what the targets are and for them to launch immediately. Uh, speaking of, of targets there, uh, I know that Nasrallah, who is uh, the, of course, the head of the Hezbollah uh, wing there in Lebanon, he's actually already left Lebanon and is in a bunker in northeast Iran with Khomeini. Uh, in fact, I got a message from a good friend of mine, a journalist there in Israel, who said that as far as to his knowledge, Israeli intelligence did not even know he left. They said they've been watching very closely his movement and said, Steve, if this is the case, this will be one of the biggest blunders of Israeli uh, intelligence to have letting him slip out of the country. I said, well, according to the intelligence report I've got, he's been in Iran for, at this point now, uh, about 20 days. And I remember you were saying that a lot, they had noticed that the Hezbollah leaders were leaving because they were expecting a strike. This was like before Christmas. So for them to, to have missed something as, as, as important as that, is, you know, is, is, you're right, it is a, quite a blunder for them in this life. Maybe they dressed him up as a woman. <laughs> you know, <so. laughs> might have been one of his wives went down there to make it look like she went in and he come out and she stayed in. So <laughs> I've wondered that myself. How how could they how could they miss something like that? And of course, maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't. And it's just uh, a good friend of mine, this journalist, thinks that they did. But he said there's been no mention whatsoever. He said this will not go down well. Uh, but anyway, I, I want to let's go in real quick here, Leo, uh, Leon, about technology of Iran because one thing that seemed to be evident that they that that the um, that was being shown off uh, by the uh, Iranians and maybe in an indirect message there was the strike on uh, Yemen at the airport in Yemen there when the Houthi rebels were using a precision-guided missile uh, to strike the airport there, and they killed the biggest part of this new cabinet that had been sworn in for Yemen. Uh, and, they, of course, they were sworn in in Saudi Arabia. Uh, when I was actually on a conference about this, uh, about uh, the situation that happened there, I was told that this basically... Uh, seemed to help blow off some of the steam of the Yemenite uh, or the Houthi rebels there in Yemen, and that they seemed to calm down a little bit since then, but they were also doing this as kind of to send a message to Israel. As uh, is, is, is put to me, mind your own business. This We're dealing with this down here, but if you're going to push at us, we do have the ability to strike in Israel as well. And, uh, and of course, that threat's very real because we know that uh, the Houthi rebels using the Iranian technology that they have with ballistic missiles and now that they've delivered them to them, uh, they have hit targets very deep within uh, Saudi Arabia already. And if you would, can you give us some thoughts that you would have on this situation as far as the technology of Iran? Well, you, you know, it's, it's almost as if it's a tit for tat. You know, we took them out at the airport with our, the Iraqi and Sulaimani, and so they hit the Yemeni parliament there at the airport. And then uh, apparently, when they went back to the superstructure or the infrastructure, they hit them again. So I, I think they're really saying, look, we're not a a, a, a junior varsity team anymore. We've definitely worked with the Chinese to improve our skills, and we've got the hypersonic, and we also have the, the ballistic missiles that are much more effective and you apparently can't see them as well. So um, oh. I, I have not seen specifically what, what missiles Iran has and I and I definitely increase that knowledge base. But for them to to do that in Yemen is, is making a statement to the Israelis saying, yeah, we know what you did in Iraq. And, you know, you had the intel of him arriving and they were pretty you were rather precise. And then talking about technology, remember the boats? They had this one huge ship, I think it's like 450 feet long, 
it has many drones and small craft on board, and it, it, it's 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 almost like a <laughs> it's like a carnival ship. There's all sorts of uh, weapons on there. I saw four or five types of drones, at long range and short range, and it's almost as if when they took out our drones a couple of years ago, they just pretty much copied it. Probably took lots of pictures and sent it there to China and then pretty much duplicated, just like, you know, China does with all of our, of all of our stuff as well. And that's exactly right. And, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, or actually we were talking before we came on air, uh, the, one of the technologies that Iran has, and I just pulled up RT where they did this article back in February, uh, where Iran had hacked it's, the, the article says Iran claims it hacked and controlled U.S. drones. It shows footage from mission as proof. And I was being told that Iran had actually acquired the technology from China. And uh, not only were they able to uh, use, and it's actually a laser-guided technology, they pinned it onto the drone, but they've actually done more than one. They've done two that I've been told and brought them down, landed them. But I've also been told that they have the ability to take a control of a missile that is inbound and then reprogram it and turn it back on the, uh, the from, from its destination. Uh, and I think this may have a lot to do too, Leon, with why U.S. and Israeli forces are being a little bit more cautious about an all-out war with Iran at this point. At least that's my thought. Well, that would make sense, you know, for them to be cautious. But, you know, I, I can't imagine the, the DOD contractor not having a, a fail-safe saying, okay, if they control it, we have the ability to do a, a kill switch, you know, and which, okay, it self-destructs if it, you know, comes back within... A, you know, within five miles of its uh, original point of origin. And so I, I can't imagine the general saying, yeah, we'll just buy this for you know, $5 million or $20 million a pop and not be worried about a, a ricochet or a boomerang effect. Well, that's good to know. And, uh, you know, I hadn't actually thought about that, but you're right, uh, a way to do a kill switch. You know, so that's very good. But this whole issue that they maybe they need to put the kill switch on uh, some of these uh, uh, drones, because granted, if it's an unmanned drone and Iran is taken and uh, getting a hold of these and landing their landing them on an airport, they should have that ability then to also uh, totally destroy that drone before it lands in Iran. And I can't understand why why they didn't do that already on the first two, or maybe they've learned from that. Yeah, except for you think with the hundreds of millions of dollars we spent on drones and all the different wars that we've been in, that we would have learned it. Because even on board my ship, I had thermite grenades that if we had to scud over the ship for whatever reason, you know, I was told I'd have to pull these pins and we'd pretty much let these magnesium thermite grenades go all the way to the bottom of the ocean at 5,000 degrees Celsius. So, you know, I can't imagine after 30 years later that they would still be that naive not to have the ability to do that. But I, I remember seeing a video after doing, after we talked about this in 2016, they pretty much captured 10 American uh, seamen on board, on board a ship. This was a small patrol boat. And I saw the, the captain's, I'm sorry, it was a, U.S. Navy lieutenant, his bar, the same as I had, and I saw that he had, um, you know, they, they captured him and they were feeding him, they looked like these, these prisoners were, were well taken care of, but they didn't scuttle the ship, and I, I could not believe that, you know, they would have a ship with 10 of our guys on there with very little protection other than 50 cal, and, you know, 248 and 308, um, caliber small arms that they were they didn't scuttle the ship and they didn't torch they didn't torch all the high tech because it showed a general who was sitting in the captain's chair and he was looking around and everything seemed to be intact and i was like this is incredible i know in my ship and in my job as anti-terrorism officer if we got to a certain point everything goes if you have to swim home you have to swim home but you're not going to let our information get in the hands of others so it seems like they've gotten more cavalier about technology instead of less. Wow. Amen. I hear that. 
Uh, one thing I wanted to share with you as well, and I, I just pulled this up on the screen, and this is uh, from a good, like I said, a good friend. He's an he's a Israeli journalist uh, that shares uh, things that are being made public over in the Hebrew languages uh, that he monitors in Israel. And he, so he wrote me uh, just, uh, actually, I think he wrote me this today. It says, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard will hold a large UAV unit exercise tomorrow. That will last two days. But is this really an exercise, he says in a question mark. Before the outbreak of the Yom Kippur War in 1973, the Egyptians stationed very large forces close to the border and claimed that this was a military exercise. He says, I guess we'll find out in the coming days. He also goes on to say it was also reported that Dubai had arrested a number of Iranians for questioning uh, on suspicion of operating as part of a terrorist attack. Uh, the arrest comes several months after another Iranian squad managed to snatch an Iranian opposition activist from a hotel in Dubai airport and smuggle him into Iran via neighboring Oman. The Israeli Ministry of Defense and Anti-Terrorism Headquarters are aware of the threats. In recent days, there has been direct dialogue to ensure the peace of Israeli tourists with the security forces in the United Arab Emirates. Beyond that, the Houthis in Yemen are threatening to strike 10 vital sensitive targets deep within Saudi Arabia using ballistic missiles and cruise missiles. Leon, what is your thought on these? I think if they light up, you know, um, if they light up Saudi Arabia, the, the, the kingdom there is going to go ballistic. And, you know, they, they pretty much expel the U.S. military from the, from the, the peninsula, at least in Saudi Arabia. And... You know, I had friends who've been there from the seventies and they talked about going to Chop Chop Square and in, in which they you know they you know, infidelity, homosexuality, theft, they would just start chopping people's hand, body parts off and heads. And so I, I can't if you know, this is still their grandson or relative of the previous chief. So I think all they would do is they would send the the planes and the and all of the armaments that we have sold them over the last forty years down to Yemen and it would be very close to a glass pit. I don't think they would go nuclear, but I think they would just pretty much annihilate Yemen if they started hitting all these places, especially if they hit the refineries like they did before with that drone strike from Iran. And they really learned after you know losing 50% of their production in one day. Well, you know, if you uh, it's been a little while back since we reported this, but we were getting in, intel reports uh, from the Middle East. Oh, gosh, I forget now, but it, it's been at least a year or longer ago. And this is when the Houthi rebels were really having some really tremendous successes. In fact, mainstream media was almost two weeks after we reported it uh, before they were bringing it out. But even then, I was watching these Houthi rebels. Not only were they taking huge numbers of prisoners of these uh, contracted mercenaries that, the, 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 that uh, Saudi Arabia was using, but the number of American vehicles that were being used. Uh, and of course, I thought about two different things. One, they were blowing them all up and they were doing it very successfully. So we knew that Iran was definitely supplying the technology. Uh, for them to be able to do this. But then secondly, I thought, well, you know, maybe American companies are probably celebrating this, uh, even though it's a loss for the, for the Saudis because they figure, well, we're just going to sell them some more armaments so they can go back in there and do it all over again. <laughs> so, yes, sir. Just like ISIS and ISIL. Remember how many of those Toyotas and all those trucks that they pretty much got from us? So yes, you know, they, they, they may be disappointed, but they're like, hey, we have more, more, more vehicles than they can sell directly to them. So yes, I... You know, it's definitely a cash flow, and they, they have they have lots of cash, so they, for them it's not a big deal. But you know, if, if they hit you know, those those key targets you talked about in Saudi Arabia, I think they might even go go to us after they've expelled all their ordinance with hat in hand and say, "You've got to do something about it." Yes. We, we, you know, we're going to lose it. You're going to lose gas. And they're going to blame it on us. And if you don't protect us, we're going to lose it. We know we kicked you out of our country, but we need help right now because we can't handle, you know, 10 infrastructure items going down all at once. I can certainly see where you're saying, saying about that, Leon. So true. So very much true. Well, brother... I, I think you've really given us some really great insight to look at and for, for the people here to, to ponder 
Uh, and I appreciate it tremendously, Brother Leon, that you've come on with us here today. Uh, I'd like, though, to go uh, a couple of times. I've already pulled your site back up as you've been talking here. doTERRA oils. Uh, and I'm not an expert on this by no means, but uh, I know that, uh, in fact, my wife will probably start ordering from you anyway because uh, we don't actually have anybody specifically we, that we order from. But, uh, but I know we have a lot of it because my wife has always just gone online and bought some from, from different people because strongly believe in this, uh, this product there. But can you share with us, Brother Leon, a little bit more about uh, you know, even how long you've been doing this, because I know you you were kind of really early on with doTERRA, so I figure you know more about the, the product than most people probably would. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. And the, you know, I, I've always been into holistic and natural healing, and then the more I learned about it, I, I was in the preparedness for 30 some years, and, and then you know, I was looking at how detrimental all the pharmaceutical drugs are, and if you look in the Bible, it talks about uh, the Greek word, pharmakia, pharmaceuticals, everything that, that Greek derivative is identical in Deuteronomy to sorcery and divination. So yes. many times people will tell me, well, you mean you're trying to say like in the Bible they're supposed to stone those diviners and sorcerers? I'm not saying that, but the damage it has caused in the, in, in the world with death attached to you know pharmaceutical drugs and iatrogenic um, disease, it's the third highest form of death in America, is, you know, people dying from properly pre prescribed drugs and the right dosage in the right amount, um, and they still die from it. So, you know, chemicals, these are derived from petroleum products. So they're not natural, whereas your body is carbon-based, these are um, petroleum-based. And so that's why you have these side effects in which the liver dies, the kidney damage. You know, you look on the side of a... a, a those labels, and you see the black box label, and it says this may cause nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, suicidal ideation, um, suicidal tendency, homicide, sleep talking, sleep talk, uh, driving, all these things, and cancer and death. And like, holy cow, I just had a headache. And now I'm, I'm having potential of dying. So more people die from that than even diabetes. Wow. And, and, and let me, so, how do, when, what, like, for example, so I'm sitting here, I just clicked on the shop part here. Uh, yeah. What are some of the examples that you would give of, of some specific uh, products that you have and what they would could be used for for people that would be interested in, in doTERRA oils? So on the positive side of things, you know, Genesis 129, God said, for I give you all seed-bearing plants for your benefit. So if you know that, you know, it, it, many people say, well, you know, I can just go get frankincense and lemon and peppermint from Wally World and it would be the same thing. And that's like saying, you know, one Intel source is identical to another. And so doTERRA is the only company in the world that we give you complete transparency. If you remember how uh, Obama said, yeah, we're going to be the most transparent government in history. And that was completely a lie. So with the oils, you can actually click on the bottle and there's a, a a QR code, and you can find out the date and what is in it. So you know the terpenes, the sesquiterpenes, all the natural things that are in it. And doTERRA is the only company in the world that does 15 different tests. So they check chirality for pesticides, for um, heavy metals. Um, they don't dilute. Many other companies will have very nice oils, but they dilute it 90%. So you have frankincense, but then you have, you know, 90% um, of it is olive oil or yoga or other oils and those go rancid after six to ten years so whereas with doTERRA all of our single oils have no shelf life you can bury them and you put your cache of 308 and a hundred years or three thousand years as long as they're cool dark and dry they will last indefinitely um howard carter found 160 meters of frankincense myrrh and sandalwood in king cuts tomb in 1922 and they tested it and it's still medically viable 3,400 years later. So wow. as long as you take care of them, they are viable. I know There's that, another company in the world proving that. I know. I'm sitting here looking at some of the products on your site there and the digest is in. That was one that my wife has had me do before, both in the, the pill form that you have here as well as the drops there. Uh -huh. 
uh, what, let me ask you this. What, what, if you can just give us a couple of examples and then we'll just have people get with you that would like to do this and how they could order things and stuff. But what are some of the examples of uh, a couple of examples of the oils and what uh, they're used for? Yeah, so pretty much the whole myriad of uh, human conditions as well as pets and livestock. So, you know, everything from sleep to stress to indigestion and diarrhea and uh, pathogens and immunity. So, you know, if it is a human condition, all the way to the big C word, it, it has you know, oils that are like frankincense. If you go to PubMed.gov, you'll see that there's over 25 studies on frankincense being anti-canceral and anti-tumoral. So, the, the, and there's over 40,000 studies on essential oils worldwide on PubMed.gov. And so, you don't have to believe myself or even the company. You can go see these studies that have been done by Johns Hopkins on cancer and sleep and stress and the whole litany of uh, conditions. So peppermint is great for indigestion and for hot flashes and for mental alertness. And then lavender is phenomenal for sleep and for cuts and burns. And, um, and it's also one of the best antihistamine in the world. And so Melaleuca is phenomenal for fungal growth. And so uh, I even wrote an article on several magazines. And if you'd like to contact me, you know, I, I, I'll, send, I'll send name the, the website and then my phone number. They can reach out to me when they get a chance. And then I can send them that article and they can see, you know, the name of the article was Essential Reasons for Essential Holes in Every Prepper's First Aid Kit. And so it talks about anything, bleeding. Uh, trying to stay awake on duty if you only have four people at three o'clock in the morning and um, trying to go to sleep once you get off duty and focus and then eating, you know, um, long-term food and you start to have diet fatigue and, and so, and then bleeding and uh, pain because now you're gardening if you haven't never gardened because you ran out of food. And so the whole issue of, you know, human, human conditions it's much emotional and physical and even spiritual. That's why the yeah, anointing oil, you know, I had frankincense and myrrh and sandalwood and hyssop. And, and so, you know, I'd love to send your, your, your listeners information about the oils of the Bible. And then, you know, I, I really came on board because of parents, but I, I, I use them with my pets and livestock. And so, you know, the chickens, instead of giving them antibiotic drugs, even Purdue Farms gives their um, chickens thyme oil and rosemary oil and they even have videos on their website so it it, it helps any any live carbon based organism can benefit from oil that's amazing Leon how now let me ask you this how can people contact you I have here four people so they can see how to be able to go to your uh, website there and again for those of you that are, that are listening there I'm going to real quick just show you how simple it is uh, when you go to doTERRA.com forward slash Leon, that's going to take you right to Leon's, uh, Leon Green's page there. Uh, how how could they be able to, you, you mentioned about email, yes, how could they email you? Yes, Leon? And actually, the, the, the correct thing is mydoTERRA.com forward slash Leon. And, um, and then... Um, my phone number is 303-495-2188, that's Mountain Time, and my email address is leon at obundance.com, leon at Oscar Bravo Uniform November Delta Alpha November Charlie Echo.com. And so, um, that is on the screen for those of you that are uh, watching right now. We'll have that right on the screen for you where you can see Leon's email and contact information as well. So, go ahead, Leon. Sorry, yes, no problem. So, yes, you can reach me that way. And if you want to request, you know, the, the article I've written for the magazines, the Survivalist magazine, as well as um, other magazines, and um. And many times I have people call me out of the blue about one issue after another, and I just say, hey, if you go to, you know, if you send me an email, I'll send you a webinar on things like candida or fungal growth. And so, or cancer. 
were oils of the Bible, so they know that the Lord you know, talks about it. Rose of Sharon and all the oils in the Bible pass here. You know, they're addressed. You know, people just have to go there and they can see that there's over 300 different references to the oils in the Bible. Amen. You know, in the Bible, and, they, and it, it has that information in there. So, you know, you have a, a very inquisitive listener base, and they love the Lord, so this would definitely give them more uh, credibility knowing that, hey, the Lord endorses it. It's not the silly commercials you see on TV that say, oh, you know, there, there are some side effects from these drugs, whereas with the oils, you know, I always tell, this is God's medicine, and God does make mistakes, and He doesn't do side effects. Amen. Amen. I agree, brothers. Well, thank you so much, Brother Leon, for, for joining us this evening and giving us uh, uh, your your insights from your military past there about the things that are going on in the Middle East. And uh, we really appreciate that, brother. And we appreciate you also representing the doTERRA products there. Uh, so thank you. And those of you that are listening, again, uh, Brother Leon's contact information on the screen there for you, as well as his website, uh, how you can... Uh, learn more about uh, the product that, that he carries there. So, uh, and, and I have to say, Brother Leon, because I don't, I don't get into promoting things very much myself, uh, but on doTERRA, I just know how much my family believes in it. And uh, so, and, and you're the only person I know personally, other than, uh, so I think, I think somebody in my wife's uh, distant family also does that, but that's how she used to get it. But uh but, you know, but the thing is, is uh, so that's why I wanted to make sure we brought this up as well. Cause maybe, maybe there's somebody out there that doesn't know about the product and don't realize how well it would benefit them. So, so thank you for taking the time to share that with us, brother. Well, thank you very much for allowing me on, the, on your program. And I enjoyed I'm excited to go you know, look at the pictures and the video that you've done for it. So I, I, I enjoy and, and many every time I get a a video of um, when I turn on my computer, it'll pop up with a new breaking news. He's like, okay, what is what is Steve talking about now? So I'm excited about seeing what's going to happen in the next two and a half weeks. And, and we were talking about, um, you know, the COVID issue. Maybe we can talk about that in the future and how the oils. And there are also some things that you can do naturally to, to help. And so, you know, the vitamin D3 and vitamin K and vitamin C and lysine and yes. zinc. If you take those five things, you know, I work with Dr. Dr. Ted Brower, and he's an awesome doctor. He's down in Florida, and he knows the stuff. And now some Houston doctors said, yes, if you do these other things, you will reduce, and you can eliminate COVID very quickly. But that's not their agenda or their narrative. They want you to be on pharmaceutical. And most importantly, that vaccine, which is one of the precursors for the market of the beast. So there's, maybe we can talk about that in the future if you get a chance. Sounds good, my brother. Thank you for, for joining us tonight, brother. God bless you guys for watching. We appreciate it. We'll be talking to you guys again soon. And by the way, while I have Brother Leon on here, uh, those of you that do not know, uh, but uh, I'm sure we've mentioned it from time to time, me and Leon will be tomorrow with John Moore on uh, The Liberty Man. Of course, that's that's actually, uh, when we do that broadcast, Brother Leon, what do we... I always know John's website is thelibertyman.com, but it's actually on uh, uh, the radio broadcast. What does that air on? Yeah, it's on the Republic Broadcasting Network, RBN. Yes, RBN, Republic Broadcasting Network. And uh, we, me and Leon always join John every Tuesday morning at 9 a.m., unless we're busy somewhere else doing something. But <laughs> so. <laughs> And then, uh, and then also we have uh, Steve O'Neill as well that joins us a lot of times on there. So, so if you want to tune in tomorrow, that's on Republic Broadcasting Network at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. And uh, you can join us there with John Moore tomorrow. God bless you and thank you for watching. God bless you.